Okay, so the title of my talk is Glycomic Diversity of uh, Homogeneous Cell Populations Derived from Pluripotent Precursors. And really what I want to try and address a bit is what I refer to, or many of us refer to as a cellular complexity problem in thinking about doing glycomics on tissues. Tissues are complex things. And can we simplify our glycomic questions to look at more homogeneous cell populations and how do we get those homogeneous cell populations? So I'm gonna talk about that problem briefly and then talk about our util utilization of stem cells to derive more homogeneous cell populations. And then finish up by talking about, uh, I think, a unique aspect of having uh, cellular resources where you can do, utilize patient-derived iPS cells to ask glycomic questions associated with specific disease-relevant cell populations. So before I jump into the data, just a brief acknowledgement of the people that actually did this work within my group. Kazuhiro Aoki, a senior research scientist, uh, initiated some of these projects and has contributed very valuable uh, experimental and, and intellectual input. Mindy Porterfield has pushed through a lot of the analysis and working on tools to help us analyze our data more robustly. And Harrison Grace, an MD-PhD student who's now back in the clinic, uh, did a lot of work on the disease uh, uh, patient-derived iPS cells I'll talk about at the end. Okay, so the cellular complexity problem, and this is, I think, pretty easy to understand. So this is a small piece of a tissue. Many of you probably recognize it as kidney. So even within this small bit of tissue, there's a many, many different cell types, right? There's the endothelial cells within the, within the capsule, within the Bowman's capsule. There are all sorts of epithelial populations and these making up these tubules. And you can tell that some of these tubules have different sorts of contents. So that likely means that those epithel epithelial cells have different functions. So the question is, if you're gonna do the glycome of a kidney, which cells are you talking about and what glycome associates with which functions? So this is a small piece of a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a sort of a tissue that you might like to know the glycome of, but things get even more complicated when you start to think about cell-cell differences in terms of the glycome. So this is a rat brain that's been stained with three different antibodies that all recognize the same protein, but they recognize different glycoforms of that protein. That is the same protein with different glycans on it. And so within this rat brain, you can see that there are regions of the brain that glycosylate this particular protein with the blue glycan. There are regions that you glycosylate this protein with the green glycan or the red glycan. And even if you go within one region of the brain and look within the laminae of the cortex, neighboring neurons are glycosylating this protein in different ways. So to be able to try and resolve and understand cell-specific glycosylation, it'd be nice to have relatively uniform populations of cells to work with. We spend a lot of time asking these questions in model systems like Drosophila, um, but in humans, it'd be nice to be able to focus on human-specific cells and try and address and understand whether there are common regulatory mechanisms across systems. But I'm gonna focus just on our human data today and talk about how we've utilized stem cells from relatively homogeneous cell populations to try and understand the, the basics of cell-specific glycomics. Uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, cells that we've derived from a, a, a human embryonic stem cell line, H9. We're gonna talk about cells that sort of cover all three germ layers, layer, germ layers uh, in human development, neural crest cells, an ectodermal derivative, smooth muscle cells, uh, a mesodermal derivative, as a, well as a precursor in this mes, oops, sorry, in this mes endothelial. So uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, smooth muscle and a precursor down this differentiation line, so-called so Wilms, <laughs> Wilms, tum Wilms tumor one positive uh, um, progenitor cells that go on to make up the uh, mesothelium. I think I've lost my pointer. Uh, as well as more, here we go, as well as more differentiated cells, uh, hepatocytes. So we'll, we'll cover sort of the span of pluripotency from highly pluripotent to more fully differentiated cells with some intermediate cells that are multipotent along the way and also representative of the three germ layers. So neural crest, uh, uh, Wilms tumor positive mesendothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and liver uh, hepatocytes as the most differentiated cell population. So uh, the work I'm gonna talk about is almost entirely on released N-glycans that are permethylated 
and then analyzed by uh, um, uh, nanospray ionization mass spectrometry, and primarily we work on Orbitrap, linear trap, and Orbitrap instruments. Um, these allow us to uh, not have to worry too much about in-source fragmentation because the, ion the ionization method is relatively soft, but also allows us to do MSN analysis to really drill down and get structural features from our, from our, our, our analysis. So for instance, two glycans that have the same composition might have very different structures, and we can fragment down to, to derive signature fragments that let us distinguish between, say, this bisected structure and a triantenary glycan. So this is uh, uh, representative examples of full MS profiles um, that have been extracted for uh, stem cells and neural crest cells, the mesendothelial uh, precursor, liver cells, and smooth muscle cells. So increasing differentiation as we go down. The high mass glycans here I've coded in green. And if you just grossly look at the profiles, you can see as differentiation proceeds, we begin to pick up more and more of these more complex non high mannose glycans. And those are annotated here. So our approach, I'm gonna, we'll dig down into these profiles a little bit more, but we routinely include in our analysis an external standard um, that we know how much we've added. This is also permethylated. And so we can, re we can refer the peak sizes of these internal, of the, of the release glycans to our external standard and derive quantification relative to that external standard. And this actually gave us our first real surprise in terms of analyzing this, these uh, cell types, in that we did expect that as cells became more differentiated, so here now going from the H9 stem cell population, to the more differentiated cells, we actually get more glycan per milligram protein as cells differentiate. And our naive, uh, uh, expectation was that all of these cell types would pretty much glycosylate to an equivalent degree, but actually much more glycan is being put on proteins uh, in, in these more complex cells, and it's not a matter of more protein, it's, this is glycan per milligram protein. If we look at sort of the broad trends in glycosylation changes as cells differentiate, um, we can, there's some obvious uh, uh, things first to see, and that is that the high mannose glycans decrease as you go from the less differentiated to the more differentiated cell types. Some uh, of the more complex glycans, especially biantenary structures, increase as you go from less differentiated to more differentiated. Other sorts of uh, uh, changes are a little more cell type specific in terms of abundance of hybrid structures, abundance of more highly branched structures. So there are sort of general trends that define what happens during differentiation and then some more cell specific types of changes um, that we can uh, dig into a little bit. But if you take together looking at profiles of approximately uh, 80 different glycans characterized that are common to all these different cell lines and then ask, can you come up with cell specific profiles? The answer is that actually you can come up with relatively reproducible uh, glycan profiles. So here we're looking at the abundance of each of these glycans relative to the stem cell population from which they were derived. So obviously for the stem cell population, they, they cluster together nicely as a group, but then each of the other uh, cell types also have a, a cell specific signature that resolves quite well from the other cell types. So there are unique patterns of, gly of N glycans that differentiate these different cell types. So we, we've correlated now with, in collaboration with Kelly uh, Mormon and Allison Nairn in Kelly's lab, uh, glycosylation profiles with glycogene transcript profiles. Um, and so Allison has built up uh, maps and, and uh, resources for understanding uh, glycosylation pathways and mapping specific enzymes to specific steps in that pathway. And this is, Michael showed, showed you some of this data before. So this is uh, 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 <laughs> some data from Allison showing all the genes involved in going from uh, uh, GLUC3, MAN9, GLUCMAC2 precursor to a tetraantenary core branching uh, precursor and, and their transcript profiles. And of course, this gets even more complex as you begin to look at capping reactions and all the enzymes involved in the different contexts. But you can put together the transcript profiles for these different differentiated cell types. And also, you'll note that these glycogene transcript values also are really quite good at resolving the different cell types that, that, we, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, and there, as differentiation increases, you also get specific uh, transcript profiles. The one sort of outlier here, which was actually kind of interesting, is that one of these stem cell uh, replicates, so these are biological replicates, 
actually clustered itself with the less, one of the multipotent lines compared to the pluripotent line. Even though the profile was actually quite similar, it actually was a little bit more similar to the neural crest. And it turns out that this replicate actually was harvested a few days later um, than the earlier replicates and actually had already started to uh, spontaneously differentiate a bit towards neural crest. So can we draw correlations between these transcript profiles and glycan structures within these cells? And the answer is yes, we can in some cases, and in some cases we can't. Um, but, but in terms of broad strokes, here's an example showing MGAT3 uh, 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 in terms of the amount of glycan abundance for uh, bisected glycans across the five different cell lines, and the transcript abundance correlates quite nicely with the glycan abundance for bisect total bisected glycans. Um, now looking at core fucosylated glycans, um, is a, there's an increase as cells differentiate towards having more, more core fucosylation, uh, and the transcript values actually are, correlate quite well until you get to the smooth muscle cells where there's not a very good correlation. So in some cases, clearly glycans are, uh, glycan heterogeneity is driven by uh, transcript abundances, but in other cases, there's gonna be other factors that are driving uh, uh, the, the heterogeneity of glycans on proteins. So there's some, this is just looking again at the glycan profile uh, clustering, there's obviously some general trends that are common across cell development as well as some specific trends that are unique to, to, to different cell types. So these are all uh, quote unquote normal cells derived from a normal uh, human uh, embryonic stem cell line. Can we expand this sort of analysis to understand changes that may be associated with specific uh, developmental disorders? And so I'm gonna talk about uh, patient-derived IPS induced pluripotent cell line um, that uh, uh, we've been working on to understand how glycosylation changes in a relatively complex neural developmental disorder. And the disorder that we've been working on uh, is an autism spectrum disorder in which patients have a mutation in a gene called neuroligin 4. I'll show you what that is in a second. And we got to study this um, patient line because uh, Charles Schwartz, a collaborator at a, a genetic center in South Carolina, came to visit us and we were talking about interesting patient lines he had. And for metabolic reasons, he thought that this particular patient um, might have an altered glycosylation profile. So he sent us some lymphoblasts, which is what he had on hand. Um, and we did uh, whole glycomics on those lymphoblasts and, and, and saw what I, was probably the most striking change in a glycome I've ever seen in any sort of human, human uh, tissue that we've ever looked at. And as a really striking change in fucosylation. So lymphoblasts are not neurons, um, although they do express neuroligin 4, we decided it would be more informative to look at neurons derived from these patients. And so this patient, that, the index patient that we started working with, this autism spectrum disorder, was a female. She had a, a relatively severe autistic uh, a spectrum uh, presentation. Um, she had a, a single allele mutation in neuroligin 4 on the X chromosome, so we got uh, IPS cells from her, from her parents, we got IPS cells from age match healthy controls, as well as uh, uh, fibroblasts from her, and uh, generated IPS cells from each of these uh, sources, and then differentiated those cells towards neurons to ask whether there were neuron-specific changes in, in glycosylation. In particular, we were focusing on fucosylation based on what we saw in the lymphoblasts. So what's neuroligin? So neuroligin, there's a, the neuroligins are a family of proteins of which neuroligin 4 is a member. Neuroligins are postsynaptic receptors that interact with neuroxins on presynaptic nerve terminals. And it's thought that this adhesive interaction stabilizes the synapse, but also contributes to the localization of specific uh, uh, neurotransmitter receptors on the postsynaptic membrane. In some cases, these are glutamate receptors. In some cases, they're GABA receptors. But the neuroligins through interactions with uh, presynaptic uh, receptors drive neurotransmitter localization and also drive downstream signaling events that are important for stabilizing a synapse. Um, human neuroligin 4 is actually, mutations have been found in multiple cohorts now of autism spectrum disorder and there's quite a bit of nice structure function rela uh, relationships now addressing how these different mutations affect neuroligin interactions with neurexin. 
But remember, the phenotype that we're seeing is that mutations in neuroligin-4 are altering glycosylation. And so we'd really like to understand how, what's the pathway that leads from this interaction towards changes in the secretory apparatus that alter uh, uh, glycoprotein glycosylation. So we asked the first question uh, wh that what happens if we take these iPS cells and drive them towards neurons on a differentiation protocol that takes about uh, 100 days to get to fully differentiated neurons, but we weren't that patient. We went to day 26 where we knew we would begin to get cortical neuron differentiation from these rosettes of precursor cells that, that the, the, the iPS cells differentiate into. So we characterized the glycome of these cultures at day 26, both in the wild type or, or normal patient iPS cells and the uh, um, uh, neuroligin-4 iPS cells, and we saw a couple trends. The first is we saw increased core fucosylation Oops, sorry. Increased core fucosylation, especially on biantenary structures in the patient. We saw a decreased Lewis uh, fucosylated structures, but primarily on bisected glycans and not on non-bisected glycans. And really not much of a significant difference in any of the sort of more higher uh, complexity glycans. So if we drill into this core versus Lewis uh, fucosylation, um, in the patient uh, uh, neurons, we saw significant decreases in outer arm or Lewis type fucosylation on bisected glycans, but, but not, not on the non-bisected uh, glycans. So here's a non-bisected, really no change, really decrease in fucosylation only on these bisected structures and increased core fucosylation um, uh, or increased fucosylation on the core, but not in the context of Lewis X, but only on non-bisected glycans. So this sort of precursor product relationship in which fucosylation is, is favored on the core in the patient, but not on bisected glycans uh, in, the, in the patient. And this correlates uh, with uh, some transcriptional changes we saw. So NGAT3 is decreased so in the patient, and FUT10 is decreased in the patient as well. So that probably exp explains the shift uh, in the uh, core uh, bisecting and the, and the Lewis type fucosylation. Um, what we, we, I'm not showing here, but we did not see any change in FUT8, so the, the core fucosylation enzyme did not change in its relative abundance. And we were concerned that maybe this was just a decrease in, in the abundance of Lewis X carrier proteins that have been characterized previously, but at least for two of these that we looked at, NCAM1 and LAMP1, that are known to carry Lewis X epitopes, their transcript level uh, was not changed uh, noticeably. So. We have these changes in glycosylation that occur as iPS cells uh, differentiate towards neurons and they're differentially affected in the, in the autism spectrum disorder patient, at least by mass spectrometry. We wanted to uh, verify this orthogonally, so we did Lewis X staining uh, uh, of these cultures. And I mentioned previously that, that as the uh, uh, iPS cells differentiate towards neuronal fates, they form these uh, uh, rosettes of, of differentiating neurons or neural precursors that give rise to cortical neurons that migrate out away from the rosette. So here's a control uh, patient culture, and you can see here's one rosette here. You can see that the precursors have high levels of the Lewis X, and as, the, as these precursors differentiate and migrate away to be neurons, the Lewis X uh, expression is downregulated in the more mature neurons. And this is normal, but in the, in the mutants, you can see here's another rosette here, here's a rosette up here, the precursor population has a much decreased level of the Lewis glycan, just as we saw in mass spectrometry, and there's not much of a change between the, the more mature cells and, and the precursor cells. So there's some, uh, we think, some um, uh, maturation phase through which these cells must go, in which Lewis X is first upregulated and then downregulated, and these autism spectrum disorder cells are somehow stuck in this differentiation uh, phase, uh, and that's reflected in, in this glycomic profile. So just sort of summarizing the, the full glycomics we detected on these spectrum disorder cells, we have some increased high mannose, decreased posse mannose, but more importantly, increased core fucose and decreased Lewis type fucosylation, but in the, differentially in the context of bisection and bisected glycans that was sort of orthogonally supported by changes in transcripts, as well as by staining cells for Lewis X expression. 
really no differences in higher order branching of N-glycans in the autism spectrum. O-glycosylation not significantly impacted. We did look at ganglicide changes and GM3 was increased significantly, but that didn't filter down into other levels of uh, glycosphingolipids, but just en enhanced levels of uh, GM3 ganglicide. So I tried to tell you a bit about how we think about addressing cellular complexity, and one way to do that is to try and use relatively homogeneous cell populations to ask glycomic questions uh, as models for what may be happening in more complex tissues, and that these approaches can actually help us uh, understand something about what's happening in uh, neural developmental disorders. And I'll just finish by acknowledging again Kazuhiro, Mindy, and Harrison that did the most of this work and uh, important collaborations with Steve Dalton for deriving stem cells, Charles Schwartz, and our collaborators in the National Center for Biomedical Lycomics, Kelly Mormon, Michael Pierce, uh, Allison Nairn, and other sorts of funding sources that have kept us going over the years. And I'll stop there.